Let's pray. Almighty God, we are so, so grateful. We're so grateful for this gathering. We're grateful for this community of faith. We're grateful for the, ex the extraordinary blessings that you have showered upon us this week. And we are grateful for the gift of an hour to do nothing but think about you. And so, God, we pray that you would bless this food and actually nourish our bodies. We pray that you would bless this time. We pray that if there is anything distracting us from actually being here and turning our attention to you, that you would take it away. And we pray that for the next hour, we can put our attention fully on you and fully considering what it means to grow closer into your likeness. And so God bless this gathering. Open our hearts and open our minds and open our ears. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sarah, it's all yours. Well, hey, guys. Oh, I feel so safe now. That was like a good... Never mind. That was a good welcome. Um, I should have Meredith introduce me all the time. I feel like I just won an Academy Award or something. Um, and so I guess I don't have to tell you who I am now. But I will tell you, uh, I am a pastor's kid. Uh, my dad's a Presbyterian pastor. So I grew up Presbyterian. Then when I went to the college, I got involved with the Baptist because that's where the cute boys were. Then I have worked or been a part of uh, Bible churches, some Presbyterian churches. Now I go to an Anglican church. I started a podcast at a Lutheran church, and here I am tonight in a Methodist church. So we're like, this is all the things, and I love it, and this is great. So when I started Theology on Tap, uh, it was Casey's husband, Andy Cunningham, and I that actually started it together in 2015. And Meredith has been around for a lot of that process. And anyway, you guys, if you don't already know it, you are very blessed to have Meredith as your fearless leader. So, you know that. Okay. Um, do you guys ever have the situation where you, um, you're having company over, and because someone's coming over, you have to clean your house, but you're kind of glad that you have to clean your house because it's been a while? I feel like that's how I am with study. Because I teach a women's Bible study, shout out, some of my girls are here tonight, um, it forces me to study. Now that I've been doing it a while, I don't have to be forced because I love it, but that's how it started was, well, if I'm going to teach other people, I guess I have to figure out what I'm doing. Um, so when I say study for tonight's purposes, um, let me say I think this is different from meditation, right? We're not meditating on, we're not just stewing on one or two passages and just kind of repeating. Um, it's different from a devotional. It's not just meant for maybe encouragement and comfort. No, this is digging in. It's learning. It's finding nuggets we didn't have before. And in my mind, it's the most fun of all the disciplines because you walk away knowing things you didn't know before and making connections you didn't make before. Um, let me tell you just a couple presuppositions or assumptions that I'm going to be working with tonight. And I say this because I just spoke the other night and I had a couple people that were a little confused at the end. So I am working under the assumption that um, I am a Christian. I believe that God exists. I've, I have to say these things. Um, I believe that he made the world and I believe that the scripture that we have is what he wants us to have. I'm not going to make any sweeping statements about you know, inspiration or inerrancy or any of that, but that the Bible we have is what God wants us to have and he wants us to study it. And if you want to argue more about all of that, our next event, which I'm going to do a shameless plug for right now, is March 19th. You can all come. We're going to be talking about does the Bible sometimes get it wrong. I don't think that the Bible does get it wrong, but that's the hook. So those are the presuppositions I'm coming into this with. I'm a Christian and many of you are, maybe not all of you, but you can still have fun studying the Bible. So why, why study scripture? Obviously, I think it's fun, but in my mind, it's not something that we should do, though we should, but it's something we get to do. What I mean by that, and I'm only going to read a couple of these, but they're all throughout the Bible. The Bible talks about all of the ways that we will be blessed and our lives will work better if we study scripture, okay? Joshua 1, 8, and 9 is that classic, everybody has heard this, be strong and very courageous, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the left or to the right, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to, everything, uh, to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful, and it goes on and on. Revelation 1, 3, I'm in Revelation world right now because that's what I'm teaching my Bible study. The very first chapter, the third verse tells us that if you read it aloud, you'll be blessed. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed, or blessed, are those who hear it and take heart, take to heart what is written. That's a pretty cool thing. It's promised blessing. And then the last one I'll read for tonight, Psalm 1, 1 to 3, you guys have probably heard this before. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners, take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the, those are the first books of the Bible, right? 
who meditates on its law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. What a beautiful thing to be like a tree planted by streams of water. Doesn't that just sound so lovely? Um, and now, hear me when I say, the kind of prospering and the kind of blessing that this is talking about is not necessarily the kind that we sometimes think about. I am not here with the prosperity gospel to tell you that every ailment you have will be healed and you'll be wealthy. I wish that was true. It is not true. But that there is a certain kind of spiritual flourishing that happens when we study scripture. And I believe that and I've experienced that. Um, I've been through a couple pretty decent sized tragedies in my life. And because of my study of scripture, and what I know about God, it has sustained me in a way that I don't think I would have had if I weren't studying. So, blessing, prosperity, this is what we get when we study scripture. Okay, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what our posture should be like as we go into it, and then we're gonna do some at the end, and we're gonna have a little social experiment, it'll be fun. But um, our posture as we head into studying the scripture, first thing is, I think we should start with what we like. Like, this does not have to be a chore, right? I mean, I realize the word discipline we don't all love, and sometimes it's not going to be as fun as other times. But start with what you like. So for me, and you will hear this tonight, I like the tough, weird, wild, crazy, rocky stories in the Bible. I love a good story. I love something that doesn't make any sense, but you have to dig in to figure it out. I'm going to give you an example of one of those in a minute. Um, and so that's where I start. But maybe you like things that are a little bit more comforting and devotional, so you start your study with the Psalms. We're going to be doing a psalm later. Maybe you like uh, studying how to live, like how does this apply to my everyday life? So start with some of the letters in the New Testament, the epistles, right? They have a lot of lists of things you can work on. <clears throat> Maybe you love learning about people, so you study a particular character in the Bible. That's really fun to do. Walk through the life of David from beginning to end, right? Um, maybe you're a history buff. You could study a particular city. Y'all, we're going to talk about Ephesus tonight. It was really broken. Or a period in biblical history. Like, what happened when Alexander the Great came on the scene? Whoa, that matters a lot for how we read our Bibles. Um, maybe you're a literature nerd, so you can study a theme of scripture. My name, of, I'm divorced now, but when I was married, I kept my married name. My uh, first last name was Garment. And so I thought that it would be really fun to study like all of the uses of garment throughout the Bible, because there's all kinds of garments, robes and such, and tassels, and, and all matter. So you could do that. Um, and then lastly, let me say this. If you're struggling, like if you're in a really difficult season of life, you can still study, but I would just go right into the deep end of where the Bible does that with you. That could be Lamentations, that could be Jeremiah, that could be half the prophets, um, and that, of course, could be Job. Read Job. Misery loves company, and he was miserable. Um, and his friends were terrible friends, so if you're like, oh, no one's helpful, talk to Joe, he gets you. Okay, uh, second thing about my posture, when I approach the Bible, I would like to recommend this to you. If I see something in scripture that I don't understand, or I don't like, or feels weird, my assumption is that I need to learn more. I need to know more about that thing. My assumption is not, oh, that doesn't belong in there. We'll sort of rip that page out, or that must be some archaic thing that was just for them. I'm not saying everything in the Bible is a how-to. Do not read the Bible as a how-to, mostly. But um, if I read something and it sounds really crazy, then to me that's an opportunity. Like, okay, let's dive in and figure this out. I'm going to give you an example of one of those things. Some of my Bible study girls are going to be sick of this, but I really struggled with um, this one particular Bible verse and no one could help me with it, so I finally just went and dug in myself, and now I think it's one of the coolest spots in Scripture. It is the spot in 1 Timothy 2, where it talks about women being saved through childbirth. Can you imagine if the recording cut out right now? <laughs> so best of luck, and I hope you have a lot of babies. And then, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but, 1 Timothy 2, this is the section. We are not going to get into women in leadership. I think it's a church. You guys have made your peace with that. And you're a pastor. But, this is what it says. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. <sighs> that does not feel good to read. But women will be saved through childbearing, don't worry, if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. What the heck does that even mean? I'm not going to ask you to explain, but does anybody feel like they have a really firm grasp on that text? And you're like, oh, man, yeah, I got it. You don't need to say this next part. Okay, good. Um, because I asked a few people, and some people were like, well, did Paul say that or did Jesus? I guess I don't really pay attention. I couldn't get a good answer, so I thought, okay, let's just go to Google. This is where I started my search <laughs> with Google. And I found a video by a pastor that I actually am not super in love with. I won't say his name, but I listened to it, 
and it started the unraveling of a whole long process, which later I'm going to talk about my, if you give a mouse a cookie technique, mm -hmm. which is just pull on something and then pull on what that pulls on and keep going. And that's what I did with this verse. And here is what I found out. I'm going to tell you, and now you won't hate this verse if you already do. Um, <coughs> the deal was that um, the first Timothy letter was written to the people in Ephesus. Ephesus was a hot mess. Ephesus, the church at Ephesus was really struggling. We read about them in many books of the Bible. Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Revelation, probably some more that your pastor can tell you about. But um, the problem in Ephesus was that there were a couple problems. One, they were worshiping um, the goddess Artemis. There was a big temple to Artemis. This is a goddess. I do not believe this is a real god. Um, but the goddess Artemis was this goddess of like fertility and life and sex and womanhood, femininity. Um, and so, and all of the practices to her had to do with sex and having children and all that kind of stuff. So there was Artemis worship going on and the new Christians were trying to be Christians, but also do a little bit of this. And then they were having a problem with Gnosticism, which is just a fancy word to say this. They really valued this like special knowledge that you could sort of transcend your body and know almost magical things. And the body is just trash and it gets in our way. But what really matters is knowledge. Gnosis means knowledge, right? So they had a little bit of Artemis worship going on, and then they had a little bit of Gnosticism going on. And when you mix those things, what you get is a worship or a tangled up sort of theology of Eve. <clears throat> they loved Eve because Eve is the first one in the Bible who, well, she's a woman, so that's awesome. Um, and she had the special knowledge, right? The snake came, the serpent came to her, and he kind of told her why. lie. And, um, and then Eve took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the people in this church are sort of conflating all these things, and they're trying, you know how it is to try to be in the world, but also be a believer, and try to reconcile these things and put them together. And the way they put it together was kind of worshiping Eve. So now Paul comes along, and this makes a little more sense. And he's like, yo, 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 no, no, no. <coughs> First of all, Eve is not some amazing heroine like you think. Eve was a problem. Let me remind you. He's not saying this that Eve was worse than Adam, but let me remind you, she did kind of move up first, you know? She's not who you think she is. And then, when he says this thing about childbirth, um, the first video that I found on Google talked about how the word through, that word, is only used one other place in the Bible. It's used in 1 Corinthians 15. I've realized that I've put all these things in the wrong order of my notes, which is awesome. So I'm just going to do this from memory. But in 1 Corinthians 15, there's a verse that says that people will be saved as through fire. Mm -hmm. And so when it's used that way, it's saying despite. Like in spite of the fire, which is refining, you will still be saved. Like you're going to go through yucky things, but salvation is from God, and so he will be faithful to carry you through to the end. Well, that kind of changes things. So now it's not that <coughs> she's going to be saved because she's having babies. It's that she's going to be saved despite childbirth. So then I thought, well, where's childbirth mentioned first in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Did know? What? Genesis. Genesis, exactly. And what, can you tell us what it is that happens? Uh, because she ate of the tree of knowledge, she now has pains of childbirth. You're exactly right. So you remember that God gave a curse to the serpent, and then he gave a curse to Adam and Eve. Part of her curse was that she would have increased pain in childbirth. <coughs> so when we connect all these puzzle pieces that are now coming together, what were they struggling with at the time? What is kind of Paul talking to? And then this idea that you're saved despite, you could almost read it as despite that curse, right? And so what this Bible verse is actually saying, you have to dig around for it, right? Um, which is the fun of study, is that women uh, don't worship Eve, uh, and you will be saved because of God, because of God's grace and loving kindness and pursuit of you, you'll be saved even despite all the stuff that got you in this mess in the first place that got the curse put there. Childbirth is totally a hyperlink, a throwback to the Old Testament that the readers at the time would have known, oh, he's referencing the curse in the first book of the Bible. So anyway, that's just an example of one where I was so annoyed by it that I had to figure it out. And now I think it's really cool because now I have this promise that no matter what I do, I could be as bad or worse than Eve. Oh my gosh, does it get worse? Like she literally listened to the serpent and ate the fruit. She's the reason why everything fell apart. And even she can be saved <clears throat> as through right, fire because God is faithful. Okay, so that is my example of how this kind of stuff can be fun. Oh, please don't close on me. Okay, three, 
If I don't understand something, that's okay. So when you're studying, I've heard this, uh, if you guys have ever watched the alpha videos, they talk about this, they use this um, example of um, studying as like a crossword puzzle. And if you get to one that you don't know the answer to, you just keep, you don't stop the whole crossword puzzle, you keep going. And as you fill things in, some of the letters from that word are gonna start to pop up. And then when you go back and read it, you're like, oh, this would be an example of one of those, right? I could go back and read it once I had maybe read um, what's happening in Ephesus and in Genesis. Okay. Lastly, as far as my posture when I study, um, and I know that you guys know this, but it's just always good to hear, pray that the Holy Spirit will illuminate things. If you are a believer and you surrender your life to the Lord, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, and it is just a ready, um, accessible help. Before you go to Google, before you go to whatever commentary or study Bible you have, just pray. Pray the Holy Spirit will open your eyes about something new. There's always something new to learn from Scripture, I promise you. All right, quickly, I just wanted to talk about some of the tools I use because I know you guys already have all of that kind of stuff, so I don't want to belabor it too long, but um, obviously a good study Bible, even maybe a systematic theology book is always fun. I have one that just has the topics in the back, so if I read something weird about angels, I'm like, oh, angels. Okay, here's some references to that. Um, a great study Bible is helpful. I have a couple study Bibles I love. One is a cultural background study Bible, and one is a chronological study Bible. Just throwing those out. Um, I also like to collect people in my life that are experts on things and to acknowledge the like bias or the spot that they come from. So Meredith is like my go-to Wesleyan person, right? And then I have my go-to sort of reform person. And, my, and if I'm teaching on Revelation, so I'm going to you know, collect people that have different end times views and ask them what they think about things. Um, and I'm constantly texting people, hey, I'm hit a snag. Or someone that I know uh, knows Greek and Hebrew really well. Like, I'll write to them and say, like, what is this word in Greek? I don't want to study Greek. I'm going to make them do it for me. It's great. Collect them like uh, baseball cards. Um, and then, of course, there are online sources. We live in a pretty amazing modern age where we really can Google things. Google a few things, obviously, because some of it is weird. But um, the Got Questions website is actually pretty good. It does come from a certain perspective, but it will tell you that if it's a tricky question, it'll say. Now, we think such and such, but here are the other views. Um, the Bible Project, anybody know about the Bible Project? All the cartoons and stuff, those guys are great. Um, and then good old Google, like I said. Okay, um, I know study will look different for different people, so I think I should also just say, when I was growing up and I would go to camp and they would talk about studying your Bible, they would talk about doing a quiet time every day. And I that became like a chore to me, and it wasn't until my like post-divorce adult life that a pastor finally said, you know you don't have to do that. You don't have to have a quiet time every day. God still loves you and you can still love him and that may not work for you. And so what works for me is a little bit different. What works for you might be different. It might be that you drive a lot and so you're gonna to listen to sermons and podcasts as you drive and then dig in a little bit later. Um, it may be a certain devotional of the book that has some questions that kind of search out the topic. Um, and it is okay for that to look different for different people. Okay, we're not all going to be opening up our Greek New Testaments. I don't even have that. I don't have Greek. Um, okay. But now to the real question of how is study transformational? That's the word, right? If you guys are doing these spiritual disciplines, it's so that it will transform you. It will um, make you more like Christ. The first thing is, the more I learn about any given passage or story, the more beautifully connected I see the Bible as being. And that's not just that it's a neat tapestry that all works together. It is one continuous story of rescue and love. The, the whole Bible is, even the weird stuff, even the list of rules that are like seem like they don't apply to us anymore, even the genealogies, all of it is one massive work talking about the redemptive work of Jesus and how much God loves us and came to rescue us. I'm going to steal uh, from a children's Bible that I love. Have any of you ever read the, or have kids and grandkids that um, the Jesus Storybook Bible. Do you know about this Bible? Perfect. Okay. So Meredith's heard this part before, but um, at the very beginning of this, before they get into all the stories, it's been talking about, oh, is the Bible a list of rules? Is it a list of heroes? And then this is, I just love this one paragraph. This is what it says. No, the Bible isn't a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story. And who doesn't love a story, right? It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a far country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything, to rescue the one he loves. It's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that has come true in real life. You see, the best thing about this story is it's true. 
There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story, the story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. And it takes the whole Bible to tell this story. And at the center of the story, there is a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. I'm going to read that one more time. Every story in the Bible whispers Jesus' name. He is like the missing piece in a puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces fit together, and suddenly you see a beautiful picture. And this is no ordinary baby. This is the child on which everything would depend. This is the child who would one day, oh, but wait, our story starts where all good stories start right at the very beginning. And then it goes on to tell the story. So listen, if you need to start here for study, start here, right? Uh, It's fantastic. But I do love that everything does work together in this giant fabric to tell this one big narrative of rescue. Um, And by the way, also just kind of selfishly speaking, the more you realize how connected the Bible is and prophecies that come true and sort of hyperlinks back to the Old Testament and all the things working together, you also realize there's no way this is just man-made. Like this Bible is not just something that a bunch of men put together, like the victor, you know, writes the stories or whatever. No, this thing is divine. And we can talk more about how that works, but it's for sure divine. Something divine is happening here. Okay, so one way it's transformational is because it reminds me of this beautiful overarching narrative. Two, my life works better when I do this. When I study scripture and I take it in, the Bible says a lot of times those who have ears to hear, right, to really listen, to really be open and take it in and actually try some of the stuff that it suggests, your life will be better. Again, not because you won't get a cancer diagnosis or sad things won't happen, but you will flourish in a way that, um, I think it's Psalm 20, no, it is Psalm 23 that talks about how he, uh, he restores your soul. That happens when you study scripture. I learn more about God's character. Uh, here's just a little example of that, something I just learned about a couple years ago, um, that in the um, creation narrative, or when um, God is making Eve, it says that he took a rib from Adam. And you've probably heard this, that that word rib probably better translates to like side. He took the side of Adam. But did you know, and if you did, that's awesome, but I didn't know this until a couple years ago, that that word side, the only other time that that language is used is when they're talking about building the temple. It's an architectural term, like the side of a holy structure that's going to house God. Whoa. So the word that's used to create Eve from Adam is to build a structure where God is going to dwell. Well, that kind of changes things, right? It's not like, ah, this old rib will do. You know, it's like, no, 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 this is something holy and sacred and special. Um, And I I just love that kind of thing. It tells me more about God and how he views me. And lastly, I learn more about myself. All of the stuff that I do when I'm studying tells me about how God sees me, um, where my weaknesses are, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible about idols, and it's easy to read that and be like, (laughs) idols, those people in the Old Testament could not stop making everything an idol. I'm glad I don't do that. But of course... The more you study, the more you realize, oh, I do it just as much. They just look different now and actually not that different. Um, But that kind of um, self-awareness, I don't think that comes from anything else. Okay, so I told you that my method of study is sort of if you give a mouse a cookie. Have you guys read that book or heard of the book? It's a children's book. The children's book is basically, if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk, and then when you go to the fridge, that's going to remind you. I don't remember the rest of the story, but it's going to remind you of something else and something else and something else. And next thing you know, there's a giant art project happening, and the house is a mess, and, and it's cute, and there are like a million of them made if you give a pig a pancake, on and on it goes. But the idea is, and this is how I do it, I don't suggest that you need to do it this way, but this feels free to me. When I'm going to study something, and I choose what I'm going to study, maybe it's a weird story, I pick something that I don't understand and I dig and then that will take me somewhere and I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. Okay, let me take that there. Ooh, okay, I wonder where that says that in the Old Testament. Probably somewhere, if I'm not already in the Old Testament or even if I am, further back. And I just keep going and going wherever it takes me because I have my whole life to do this. I don't have to stay on track, you know? Maybe that's not how you work, but this is how I work and this is how I find these interesting tidbits and then they all come together. So I thought I would give you an example, if you are open, of, I have two, but for time's sake, I'm just going to read you one, or tell you one, of a time that I was teaching on something, and I needed to pull at a thread and then discover something new. I was going to be teaching a bunch of high schoolers, which that's a really daunting thing, teaching high schoolers, because they're mean. Um, I was going to be teaching them the story of David and Goliath. Like, oh my gosh, everyone knows this story. Like, there's nothing new I can tell them about David and Goliath. Yeah, little kid, and then the stones, and he kills Goliath, the big bad giant. Um, 
So I was like, but I have to find something, something new, something interesting, some angle. So um, I just started reading it and started, you know, in your Bibles, like sometimes it'll have that little thing you can click on if you're on a phone or you can look at the bottom of your study Bible and it'll tell you like a fun fact. Well, when we got to the part about Goliath's armor, raise your hand if you know what his armor is described as, Goliath's armor. Okay, I love being able to tell you guys all this stuff. It doesn't describe it as like chain mail because it's all this heavy, you know, mostly bronze metal. It's like a big helmet and breastplate and sword and whatever. But what's on his body is described as scales. In fact, when it talks about bronze scales, the bronze word is very close to the word for serpent. And it is fully intended. I'm not alone on this. I've checked this through several scholars. Don't worry, I'm not going rogue on you. Um, It's basically saying he was a bronze serpent in the wilderness tempting and mocking God's people. Well, does that sound familiar? That should sound familiar. Um, And so I was like, well, where do we first? I often ask, where do we first see such and such in scripture? That's one of the little things that I do and always opens up something cool. Where do we first see a serpent? You're not allowed to answer this one. Where do we first see a serpent in scripture? Genesis. The answer is almost always Genesis. Okay. It's Genesis or Jesus is the answer. Um, right. It's, it's in the curse after sin has entered the world. It's, um, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, this is the seed from uh, Eve, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So there's this idea that in the end, whoever does the rescuing is going to crush the head of the serpent. But the serpent's going to get his nip in the heel, but he will be crushed. Okay, so now I have this idea that maybe, just maybe, and go with me, David is sort of representing the seed of the woman, and we know that he is um, in the line of what would be Jesus, right? And Goliath is representing this bronze serpent. Huh. So David's victory over Goliath was kind of this echo of the promise in Genesis 3, but it's not the whole thing, right? Because they're people, they're not God, but it is starting to give us some ideas. And then what happens in the story after David kills Goliath? In the head, by the way, so he crushed his head. Does anybody know what David did right after he killed? Well, then they all go in and they defeat the Philistines. But after that, cuts his head off. And where does he take it? Anybody know? He, huh? Huh? He takes it to Jerusalem, which, by the way, wasn't even Israelite-like property then. He takes it to Jerusalem. Why? I don't know. Maybe because the Lord told him to because it would make for a really cool story that I get to tell you now. Because in Jerusalem, where Jesus was crucified, was on the hill of Golgotha, which is called Place of the Skull. And many people think Golgotha is just a contraction of Goliath of Gath. Goliath of Gath, Goliath of Golgotha. Um, again, y'all can Google and fact check me on this. I'm not making this up. But how cool is it that you have this sort of microcosm story with David and Goliath? He's the serpent who's coming after God's people. He's defeated in the head. Then they take his head to this place, which is the place of the skull, on which Jesus crushes death. That's pretty cool. Like, that is why I love to study, because now I can walk away and say, okay, so all of this happened not just because it's neat, But that tells me something, too. I will tell you this. A lot of people like to do this thing where they read a story and they're like, well, who am I in the story? Which is fine to do that from time to time to kind of who do I identify with? But people will do this thing where they'll say like, oh, so I'm like David and I'm crushing my giants. I'm conquering my giants, right? No, 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 no. David did that because the Lord enabled him to. The Lord is our champion. God is the conqueror. He goes before us. We just get to be part of the ride. And that is transformational because when I'm in any given situation in my life and things are not going the way I want them to, I don't have to muster up the energy like, okay, God, I'm going to white knuckle this. I'm going to get through this. Um, I can be obedient to the Lord and I can pray that he will lead the way and he will be my champion and I will follow him into battle. That's game changing, right? You approach everything differently. You approach uh, your relationships with your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend, your children, your coworkers, your boss, all of these things differently. And that's just one story. So all that being said, I thought the best way that we could kind of dive into all this is to give a try to my wacky method of study, which is this, if you give a mouse a cookie, just kind of taking things and exploring it and seeing where that takes us. And this is going to be a wild ride because I don't have this planned out. I mean, I have a couple things to throw in the mix, but um, how many of you have either a Bible, I put some Bibles on the table or a Bible app that you can open so we can all have a Bible in front of us. Okay, enough of you at your tables, right? 
I thought we could explore a psalm that we've heard a million times and see if we can get something new out of it. No, it's not Psalm 23, but it could be, because there's new stuff all the time. But I want to look at Psalm 51. So open in your apps or your Bibles, or if you have it memorized, um, Psalm 51. And before we do this, I'm going to take my own advice, and I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will open some things up for us. So join me. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that is always giving us something new, something comforting, something inspiring, something challenging. And God, I pray that right now, as we open this passage up, that you would illuminate, you would bring it off the page and into our hearts. God, that we would be transformed because we know more about you. We know more about ourselves. um, And we can walk in confidence knowing all of that. God, um, point things out to us. Have our eyes be open and our ears be open to something new. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so Psalm 51, I think I have it in NIV because I'm, that's just, I like NIV. I think it's readable. I realize that's maybe not like the best one. We don't have to get into a thing about translations, but um, before we even start reading it, if you've opened up to Psalm 51, will someone just read, there's probably a little thing at the top of it before we get into the actual psalm that describes the context for it, which is so handy that our Bible does have to work for us. Who wants to read that for me? Yeah. For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Okay, now the Bible does not always make it so easy and just give you the context before you read it. You often have to go digging. But this one is awesome because it just tells us, hey, this thing you're about to read is written by David, and it was written after he got busted. If you don't remember the story, he had an affair. Some would even say, based on his powerful position, it was a rape. Um, And then he had the husband of that lady killed on the front lines of battle. I mean, these are bad, bad things. Um, So sexual crime, murder, and then he was kind of callous to it and wasn't even letting himself realize how bad it was. And his, uh, the prophet Nathan came to him and told him this whole story. If you've watched the Veggie Tales, it involves ducklings. But anyway, um, and, it's, and so he tells him this whole story. And King David's like, oh, this is terrible. Who is this person? He deserves to die. And Nathan's like, oh, that man is you. Um, or in Veggie Tales, that man is you. Right? Okay. Um, and David all of a sudden is like, just, it, it all hits. And he realizes just how awful he's been and how he's um, sinned against God, and he pens this passage. So I want us to read it with that in mind. Um, How about we just, instead of me just reading the whole thing, what if we just go like five verses at a time, pop your hand up if you want to do the next five. Who would read the first five verses? Okay, hit me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your past judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Who wants the next five? Go for it. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with this up and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and block out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Who will take the next five? Go for it. Cast me not away from my presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and that pull me of the human spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show, shall show forth thy praise. All right, the last section. <clears throat> For you do not desire the sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. 
Okay. So first of all, I love that we had all the like different translations. Got a little King James or New King James over there with the these and thys. That was beautiful. It called, it, your version said, God of my salvation. I love that. What was it? Oh, New American Standard. Okay. Um, so before we dive into maybe some of the um, nifty little nuggets, are there any words or phrases that kind of jump out at you as maybe like being a little tougher or I don't quite understand what that means? We're going to go for like confusing or difficult. Just throw your hand up and say it or don't even throw your hand up. Just anything that you're like, I don't know what that is. Okay, yeah, that's a little weird. Um, anybody think they kind of understand what the bones you've crushed rejoice means? We're gonna we're gonna like group think this. The first thing that comes to my mind is the bones are hidden in there inside. Yeah. Know, like the, not just the physical consequences that have happened, but like, can you take care of the inner mm-hmm. place that you, by your spirit, kind of like destroy? Like, Ooh. That is so different from what I thought, but I love it. I'm, I mean, this is not one of those things where there's no wrong answers, but there can be multiple answers, right? I mean, this is poetic, and so we get a little bit of license to say, like, yeah, I think that that's a, a beautiful way of thinking about it. Um, it could also just be that he's using really poetic language to say, it feels as if my actual bones are crushed. Have you ever felt like that? Like, you know your bones are fine, but it feels like uh, the weight is crushing them. What's another sort of tricky, like, what does this word mean? I haven't heard of this, or I don't know much about it. Who said that? Say it again. Yes, I was hoping someone would say hyssop. Yes, I have a whole little thing here about hyssop. Okay. I, um, I mean, when I first studied, when I first really dug into this, I didn't know much about hyssop either, but it sounds Bible-y, right? And when we don't talk about it today, no one's going to Trader Joe's and getting a bunch of hyssop, okay? Um, so do I have a volunteer that would just Google um, first use of hyssop in the Bible? Would someone Google that? We're, we're using the... Um, all the nerds are racing. What's that? All the nerds are racing. Who gets it first? Okay, I'm, I'm thinking millennial Gen Z is going to win this one. Let's see. I just want you to tell me the first... Bible reference. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What's just, what's the reference? Like, what's the book and number that it says? That's okay. Somebody over here has it? Exodus, yes. Exodus 22, right? Okay. So, you can either jump there with me or you can just listen because here's what Exodus 22 says. This is the first time that the word hyssop is used in the Bible, so let's see if it makes any connection. And by the way, maybe we'll hit a dead end. We won't because I did this ahead of time. But, um, but you might, but that's okay. You're reading scripture and nothing ever goes, I mean, scripture never returns void. It's always going to be doing something to refresh you, right? So Exodus 22, uh, I'm in verses 21 to 23. This is what it says. Um, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, this is, by the way, right before the Israelites are going to be released in the big story of the Exodus, right? Pharaoh's like, yes, you can go. No, you can't. Yes, you can. And this is the last thing. Passover comes from this, right? The lamb, I mean, the um, angel of death is going to pass over them. So this is what it says. Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. I think you guys know this because Meredith is your pastor of the Passover lamb. In the New Testament, of course, it's Jesus. Take a bunch of hyssop, this is a kind of plant, dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on top and on both sides of your door frame. You guys have heard the story before, right? If you've been in church for a while, they put the blood over the door, okay? Um, None of you shall go out of the door of your house until the morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So this blood that's put up there with hyssop is going to save uh, God's people. Hmm. Okay, so now let's go back to uh, our passage in Psalm 51, and let's see what it says about hyssop. Um, Leslie, do you remember where that was? What verse? Seven. Dang, oh, you guys are quick. Okay. So it says, cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. So David, in this just, I'm, I'm sick about what I've done, he's referencing back to the story of the Passover, Someone give me a stab at what that means to you or what that might mean for David that that connection is being made. 
again, there's not really a wrong answer here, but like, how does that maybe make it deeper, different for you? Judgment will pass over him. Yeah. Like, he already knows he's going to be forgiven, right? <clears throat> By the way, and we don't have time for this tonight, but if we were to jump forward in time, hyssop is also used at the cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll let y'all look that up later on your own time. Very cool, though. And that's just one word, right? That's just the word hyssop, and I was hoping. Thank you for saying that. Um, something that jumped out to me, um, and I'm going to have my trusty um, friend here read this. You have your light ready because it's hard to read. Uh, In verse 3, it says, um, and at least my version says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And I was like, does he mean it's always before me like I'm always aware of it? Because he literally didn't have it in front of him until Nathan told him. So his sin actually isn't really all in front of him. But one of the Bibles that I recommended earlier had this to say. Read if you can. Yes, I know my transgressions. In the ancient Near East, individuals typically claimed that they were mystified concerning what they could possibly have done to offend the gods. Several factors contributed to this ignorance. One, the gods of the ancient Near East had offered no permitted revelation of themselves that might be used as a guide. Two, the gods were not characterized as acting consistently from one day to the next, making it difficult to assess one's standing in any given circumstance. And three, offenses often took the form of neglecting rituals of which the guilty individual was not even aware. As a result, in Babylonian penitential literature, um, example, the offender just simply accepts blame for a vast range of sins, hoping in the process to confess to whatever has offended the God. However, at other times, he lists offenses and asserts that he is well aware of his sins. In the Hittite prayers. You can actually pause there. That's fine. Thank you, though. So, so this little nugget is saying the, in the culture of this time, your sin was not always before you. You didn't know half the time what you'd done because you had these capricious gods who you had to guess and you had to be like, is it this? I'll slit my wrist. Is it this? I'll sacrifice my child. Is it this? I'll do whatever weird thing you want me to. You didn't know what it was. David is saying here, um, because I know God and I know what he expects from me, I might not be aware of it all the time but I know where I stand with God, right? And this is another thing that brings me comfort about God. I don't have to guess, like, oh, am I making God happy? Am I making him sad? I don't know. What mood is he in today? Is he in a I love Sarah mood or is he in a naughty Sarah mood? He's always in a love Sarah mood. He's always in a I love fill in your blank mood, always. Um, And we know what he expects from us because he just tells us. He's clear. He gave us his word and we know it. We can go and read it. Um, So that's one that I... Uh, And another thing I wanted to point out that um, I thought, raise your hand if on verse 10, when it says, create in me a pure heart, O God, does that remind anybody else about somewhere else in the Old Testament that it talks about something that's going to be done with your heart? It's okay if it doesn't. Oh my gosh, yes, Ezekiel. What's the phrase? I mean, you don't have to have it memorized, but like, what's the idea in Ezekiel? Right, it says, I'm going to take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's a theme in the Old Testament, right? Um, And again, I just think it's cool how it all connects. This is what it says. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. So if that had seemed familiar or if you'd had a little thing in your Bible that said, go back and read Ezekiel, which you probably did, a little note or a little thing to click on, then that tells you something else about God, right? It tells you that... um, We don't have to, again, white knuckle it and be like, okay, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. We should be trying to do better. But also, God is going to do that. God is going to give us a heart of flesh. God is going to give us a new heart, and he will do it as many times as it takes. Is there anything else that jumps out at anybody or sparks curiosity or maybe even confusion? I don't promise to solve it tonight, but just wondering. Teaching transgressors. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if I remember correctly, he's saying cleanse me, and then I can go out and help other people, right? Is that kind of how you guys take it, or what do you think? What verse is that? Uh, 13. 13. So let's read 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. What a beautiful phrase that is, the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then he's already telling God, like, I know that you'll do this for me, and I'm going to take that out and tell others. Does anybody else have a different read on that, or what do you think about that? Did you just like that, or did it kind of seem weird? No, I, I like it because he is uh, committing that he 
Oh, yeah. He will take action above and beyond the sorrow and the lament. Yeah. I want to address, put your attention on one other thing, and then I think we're actually doing fine on time. Um, in verses 16, 17, and 19, I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts. It's, he's talking about sacrifices. I don't, okay. Who said yes? That was another thing that struck you? Okay. So in 16, he says, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Now, doesn't God sometimes take pleasure in burnt offerings? Because he did say... Earlier in the Old Testament, people should do that, right? Okay. Then verse 17, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. And then in verse 19, it says, then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous. So in two verses, he goes from not delighting in the sacrifices to delighting in the sacrifices. What do you think happened? Like, what do you think David means when he says you don't delight in it? And then he's like, oh, but you will delight in it. Any thoughts? Maybe say some more about that, or maybe somebody else. Boom. Yeah. So just doing the thing, I mean, there is something lovely about doing the motions. You guys are studying disciplines right now. There's something good about that. But he recognizes we're, we're not at this point right now. Like, I can't be like, oh, no problem. Here's a bird. I don't know what the different things were. I can't remember. Um, he knows that's not what God wants, right? And so he says, what you want from me, and then he tells us right there, you want my heart to be broken about what I've done. And then once I, my heart is in a different place, then you will accept these offerings, right? I thought that was kind of cool. Um, let's see. Is it a little bit similar to like how he's always calling us to repent? And it's almost like, you know, the broken spirit, broken interior, like in order for you to be broken for what breaks his heart, you have to realize that there is a problem. Yeah, that there's a problem. Yeah. It's like there's a repentance that's needed. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And and perhaps um, what he's saying is we, okay, God does not want, we don't do things to gain God's um, Say, approval forgiveness, mm-hmm. you know whatever you want to say um, but we do do things out of gratefulness mm-hmm. and thankfulness mm-hmm. and so therefore at that point well that's what we're doing so he does accept that that's beautifully said yes that was awesome did you guys hear everything she said? That was awesome. I say that like you can't hear. I know the mic is just for the recording. I'm just loud. Um, so one thing that I do like to do when I'm, um, and this works for meditation and study, but is when I read a section of the of scripture, I do what we just did, like what, what stands out, what's weird, what's different, what's confusing, and then I ask where else is that in the Bible, or I'll Google things, and then I'll follow the train. Um, the other thing I will often just ask myself is, um, what does this tell me about God? What does it tell me about me slash humanity? And then, like, what am I going to do with this? Where is this going to take me? What, why is, how is this going to affect my life today? So I thought that would be how we close this out, is just asking you guys, if you are willing, first, what does this passage tell you about God? What's like an attribute or something about God that we pick up from this? He's faithful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He restores. Very good. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Merciful. Yes. And this is mercy, right? There's a tiny sort of difference between grace and mercy, and mercy is not getting the punishment you deserve. Um, yeah. I like that there was even space for David to be able to have this conversation with God. He didn't have to come in cowering, right? Or, you know... Um, like, he knows that God loves him even when he's done something really terrible, and it was quite terrible. You know, the Bible various times calls David a man after God's own heart. Um, what's interesting, I looked those up yesterday. I thought about doing a bit on this. Um, I say a bit like this is a comedy show. I thought about doing part of the lesson on this. Um, the Bible has Samuel and other people say, or like, it's from God's mouth, basically. Like, David is a man after my own heart. David isn't the one saying it. Other people in the Bible do like to refer to themselves as good things. Like John, the beloved disciple, and I don't know, Moses has one about how smart he is. But but David doesn't say that about himself. God says that. He says he's a man after my own heart. And he says that long before and after he's done this thing. 
So I love that because it's like, oh, you could do the most terrible thing and you could still be searching after the heart of God, right? Okay, so what's maybe one or two things, three or four or five, whatever, that it tells us about us? You don't have to give your personal confession list, but what's that? I think David represents all of us. Mm -hmm. We're all, you know, we're we're all drawn to the the dark side, the evil Mm -hmm. that that Satan represents, and God knows that. And God knows that's a very powerful pull away from him. And then when we when we do falter and we do fall away and drift away, God's willing to, to accept us when we come back. Amen. Yeah. In, in this version of it, um, it's kind of like David is um, bordering with God. Oh, okay. Restore my, you know, restore me, and I'll do this for you. Hmm. You know, I mean, that's how I kind of looked at that one. It says, restore to me again the joy of your salvation, and make me willing, make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to the sinners, and I will. So, I mean, it's kind of like, okay, do this for me so that I can go out and do it for you. It's kind of like... Yeah. Okay. I can see how you could read it that way. I don't read it that way only because I think when you read the larger narrative of David, I don't think that's his posture toward the Lord. But if it were, I don't think that'd be the worst thing in the world. Right? I mean, I don't, that's not how God operates, that we can bargain with him. You ask how we... But yes. What we do. Yeah. And we do that a lot of the time. We 100% do. Yes. You know, I mean, you're in a bad situation, and you say, "God, do this," and I promise you, I'll. I'll pray you know, more. I'll read my Bible more. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of looked at it like that, as from yeah. a human standpoint. Yeah. No, I, I, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you could just say it. You don't have to raise your hand. I think that it tells me about myself that I have a good shepherd. I mean, oh. Well, Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I meant to say something about the the community aspect. Like tonight, we're we're as a community, we are like dissecting this thing together, right? And figuring out what nuggets. But but the Bible is full of that kind of thing. Yeah, he needed Nathan. Um, I will encourage you. We're, we don't have to keep going tonight. I'm not going to make you you know confess your personal sins that this brings to the front and how you're going to live this week better or something. But um, I would encourage you to do a few things. One, Google which other Psalms David penned after the Bathsheba incident and read them. Read them in light of that. And you can, that's an easy Google. It'll tell you. There's like five of them. You can also look and see when those Psalms are quoted other places in the Bible. Like this one is quoted in Romans, and I'm not going to get into it because it's this kind of big theological thing that if I tried to unpack would take too much time tonight. But have some fun with it. See where things are connected. If your Bible tells you where, that's great, or you can Google it. But, um, and see what nuggets you might find that you didn't find before. The church where I worked most recently, when they would give their second graders Bibles, and every, you guys do second grade or like third grade, okay. Um, they would say this phrase, um, the Bible is um, simple or shallow enough for children to be able to jump in, but deep enough that you could study it your whole life long. And I think that's so true. I mean, y'all, when I hear that a pastor is going to preach on the prodigal son, I'm like, oh, no. As I know everything there is to know. And then, of course, you know how it is. If it's a good pastor and you guys have one, something new is going to come out of that. Um, and it's so fun. To me, this is why I love studying scripture. I think it's really fun, and it makes my life better, and so I hope that you guys will do some more of it. Thanks. See, isn't Sarah awesome? Um, so I do encourage you if um, theology, the, what's the new name? Theology by the Pint. Um, does have a lot of po- a podcast, and um, and there's a lot of really interesting uh, topics that come out on that. So if you're interested in more just theological stuff, that's a that's a fantastic thing to look up and to listen to. Uh, for the she's she's able to hunt down a lot of really cool guests to get on that thing. 
And sometimes, yes, including Meredith. Okay, let's close in prayer. Almighty God, we are so, so grateful that you gave us minds, and we're so, so grateful that you gave us your word and so many opportunities to hear from you and learn about you more in your word. And so, God, I pray that you would uh, kindle within us a constant interest to learn more, that you would open in our lives the time and the space to be able to learn more, and that you would fuel our intellectual curiosity even as you fuel our spiritual curiosity that as we dig deeper, we can find uh, the well that never runs dry and encounter you. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us as we go out into the evening and keep our spirits attuned to yours. As we pray in your name, amen. 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 amen.